Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Robertson, for that introduction. And there is no chance that my pages are going to fly away today. But congratulations uh, to all the graduates, your parents, your significant others, your friends, supporters. You all have much to be proud of today. You join a long list of distinguished alumni from this proud institution, America's first and still its premier business school. I went to the second oldest business school in the country, but I have nothing but tremendous respect for Wharton. My company city hires a number of Wharton grads every year. This year alone, 25 of you and 67 undergraduates will be joining city. And uh, more importantly, we haven't given up on the rest of you either. <laughs> I must also commend you and congratulate you on uh, your sense of timing in the last two decades. These are probably the two best years to be in school. You know, it was a great time to study the key issues of both uh, the American and global economies. The only way to have learned more is to have lived it, an experience that I can assure you was not full of pure enjoyment either. So over the last two years, as you've been educating, uh, being educated, I too was getting educated, facing crises, making decisions, and many of them very difficult. People ask me quite often, they say, uh, what prepared you to make these decisions? And, and certainly I had no formula. There were no cases, there were no courses, uh, the problems were too new, they were too unique, too complex, and the world was too fast moving for any of that. At the same time, I also had a whole career to look back on, a series of decisions that got me to that point and those decisions were not necessarily made with foresight. I never really planned my career. And I made decisions along the way that I thought made the most sense. And I cannot say that those decisions in and of themselves somehow prepared me for what lay ahead. But they did hone my instincts and give me confidence in my judgments. And I thought I'd share some of those decisions with you today. The first important career decision was to determine what I really like to do. Now, like any good Indian son, I had to become an engineer or a doctor. I'm sure some of you can relate to that expectation. So I chose engineering, but two things became very clear. First, I was not passionate about it, and two, I was not great at it. So I decided, um, you know, I should switch to finance, uh, thinking that the world could always use another banker. I got my master's, I got my PhD, and, uh, and I figured out, by the way, that as I took my next logical step with for teaching, that I wasn't any better at teaching either. Uh, so uh, it was clear to me, though, that I had passion for the subject, but that passion did not translate into a passion for teaching it. I was much more interested in practice than in theory, which then led me to my second big decisions, where to go next. Leaving academia for Wall Street was extremely risky. Um, I already had a major teaching job at a university, and as your professors can tell you, they are hard to get and quite coveted. So I had to get this right. I really had to find the right culture and the right company. And back in 1983, I chose Morgan Stanley, attracted above all by its culture at that time. In those days, it was a small company. There were about 2,500 people. It was a private partnership, which means that all senior bankers put their own money on the line every day. They had skin in the game. And the whole purpose of the firm was focused on one and only one thing, which was serving clients. Bankers were hired for the long term. It was not meant to be a place where you put two years to work and then moved on. Hiring meant making a long-term commitment to employees, and uh, this was an apprenticeship model of learning. No one was ever left alone to sink or swim. Every process was collaborative. And yet, we were also trusted and given the freedom and responsibility to succeed without micromanagement. 
While the atmosphere was intense, it was also not a doggy dog competitive environment. People helped each other and it became very clear over time who thrived in the firm's culture and who did not. It was a true meritocracy. Two things mattered more than anything else, integrity and quality. Was our work guided at all times by the best interest of our client? And was it absolutely first class in every respect? Over time, I rose to become the head of the syndicate desk at uh, Morgan Stanley, and when companies wanted to go public, I wanted to get the deal. I was fortunate to price deals like Netscape and Cisco and Compaq and uh, do a lot of major capital raises for General Motors, GE, IBM. I became used to being my own person, posting my own results and being accountable for myself. But soon I faced the third key decision and I consider this to be a turning point. Would I remain an individual producer or would I take on the responsibility of producing the producers could I groom and manage my own team and take pride not in my achievement, but in what others achieved? And there was only one way to find out. It required stepping out of my comfort zone, which can be risky and extremely scary, but I did it. I accepted the job as the head of the derivatives business. And managing people is so much more complex than managing projects, but it's also a lot more rewarding. It's a lot more conducive to personal growth. The fourth key decision was the hardest of all. I had spent nearly all my career at Morgan Stanley. I was told that I was going to be groomed for the top job. Morgan Stanley merged with Dean Witter and I became the president of the part of the company that constituted the old Morgan Stanley. The problem was that the merger had changed the culture of the company. My, my vision was too different from what the company was becoming. I wanted to emphasize what I thought was the best of Morgan Stanley's talent-based entrepreneurial culture. The company, on the other hand, seemed to be headed in a more process and product-driven direction. And I don't doubt that had I stayed, I would have been successful to all outward appearances. But, but that was not the company I wanted to run, and so I left. I started a business with a talented team of partners with whom I had been working for years. Our business was soon acquired by Citi. We were thrilled to become part of a 200-year tradition and to join the only bank active in virtually every country around the world. Now, when the troubles at Citi started to become apparent, the CEO asked me to take over Citi's institutional clients business. This is essentially the same business I ran at Morgan Stanley, somewhat larger with a few more businesses on top of that, but that's not what I had come to City to do. But I couldn't say no. And that's my fifth decision that I want to share with you. And the reason was very simple. When your boss asks you to do something, you can't refuse uh, unless it's unethical or unless it's simply wrong for you, and this wasn't. The team needed me in that role at that time, and so I took the job. But that didn't last long either. In a very short period of time, I faced another and the last important decision of my career. I was offered the job of CEO of the whole company, and this time there was no question that I would do it because I knew what needed to be done. To recap very briefly, for those of you who may not be familiar with the story, I became CEO of Citigroup in December 2007. Now, for those of you who know what happened at that time, that was a little bit like becoming the captain of Titanic after hitting the iceberg. So first, we needed to come up with a plan. We took a clear look at our company's DNA and our core strengths and the future of financial services. From there, it was a short step to understanding what parts of the company made sense for Citi's future and which businesses would better thrive elsewhere. We formulated a clear and credible plan, a return to our roots, get back to the basics of banking, put clients at the center of everything we do, 
and sell off non-core businesses, and we stuck to that plan. We had to be resolute. We had to be really resolute in staying the course. We were second guessed from the outside, and sometimes even from the inside, and almost continuously. The temptation to swerve from the plan was at times overwhelming, but we didn't. If I had, I would not be standing here with you today. The rough seas rising to a typhoon in late 2008-2009 lasted two years. We needed significant help from the American taxpayers to survive, but we made it. The city is now profitable and has been for five straight quarters. We're a much leaner company. We've shed nearly $500 billion of assets without compromising our global presence in 101 countries. And we repaid with gratitude the taxpayers in full, earning them a $12 billion profit on their investments. So for all of you here, if I were to distill down the lessons from my own experience, they are very simple. They're almost truisms and nothing that you haven't heard before, but they are worth internalizing. Find your passion and follow it. Choose the right company and culture. Don't fear leaving your comfort zone. Have the courage of your convictions and stay the course. As you graduate, you are entering a business world that is in some ways very similar to the one that I found in 1983. But in other ways, it's very different. While the financial services industry is much larger today, I believe it looks a lot more like the industry in 1983 than that of 2008. It's more focused on its core strength. It's more focused on serving clients. And in many ways, we're getting back to that culture that excited me in 1983. And at least, we're instilling that culture every day at City. The wider world, on the other hand, is completely different. When I started, the domestic market was everything. Japan and Western Europe mattered too, but nowhere else. It was a hub and spoke world, and New York was the ultimate hub. Today, we live in a network world. All roads no longer lead to a few key hubs. They go everywhere. They lead everywhere. Emerging economies can trade with each other without ever having a single banker, CEO, or government official ever set foot in New York and do quite, quite well. So your careers will be defined by massive trade and capital flows within the emerging markets, explosive growth in new consumer blocks as the middle class grows, and increased digitization, things that few of us, if any of us, were thinking about back in 1983. Ideas find support from capital more quickly than ever, which makes entrepreneurship more accessible than ever. But more ideas from, to choose from means more complexity and more opportunities to choose wrongly. So you're entering a very exciting world, but also more complex. I had to adapt to it over a course of my career. You've grown up with it. That gives you a very, very special advantage that I know you will use extremely wisely. So let me wish you the best for your future and all your careers, and however and wherever your past might take you. Congratulations again, and thank you.